The peace of the Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to our Redeemer Lutheran Church. It's another beautiful day in Jacksonville, Florida. I may sound like a broken record, but we do have some pretty nice weather, don't we? And we've had a string of Sundays where it's been sunny, and uh, today is nice and cool as well. So we welcome you to our worship, those who join us in the sanctuary, and also those who join us by live stream from many different places. We also want to welcome those who are listening to the service on our Redeemer Lutheran Radio. Uh, It is a joy to know that you can be with us today as well in spirit as you worship the Lord from afar. As we gather for worship on this uh, 21st Sunday after Pentecost, we continue the sermon series, Inspiring Truth for All. It actually concludes next week But today we have another of the beautiful verses that uses the word all. Uh, And in this case, it's from 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, and 3. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So today, we say, thank God for y'all. Our first hymn is number 913, O Holy Spirit, Enter In. We join in singing. You'll need to open up the hymn book to that page. You may remain seated as we sing.
rise as we worship and thank the Lord. This is the day which the Lord has made. From the rising of the sun to its setting. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Sanctify us in your truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. may be seated as we join together in the Old Testament reading. You'll find the lessons printed on the back of the bulletin. And we thank Donna Taylor for being our lecturer today. Good morning. morning. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah 45, um, chapter 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasure of darkness and the hordes and secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, and God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word with much for you received the word in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, that you came to become an example to all believers and man Macedonia and Acacia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Acacia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. So we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before we join in singing the hymn, I hope that you uh, share my gratitude to God for our church family. Uh, when I chose the sermon title, Thank, thank God for Y'all, I mean it. Uh, and I say that not only about this congregation, but from, as, from my earliest memories, I've always had a family, and I've also had a church family. And of course, when you get married, then you have another family, don't you? Uh, but I just can't imagine going through life without having a church family where you know that uh, people will bear your burdens. In other words, they will bring your, your needs and, and uh, problems to the Lord in prayer, uh, share love and understanding. That's really what it's all about to be the Christian church and uh, a Lutheran congregation. And so now we join in singing that familiar hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. gospel for this 21st Sunday after Pentecost is Matthew chapter 22, beginning at verse 15. 
Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his talk. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are, a, are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house in the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house in the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house in the place where your glory dwells. We join together now for our catechism reading in reading the third article of the Apostles' Creed and its meaning. Uh, we begin together, and then I'll ask a question in italics, and then we continue together. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth, and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. In the Gospel reading, we see that Jesus and the disciples were continually having to deal with people who did not know him as the Messiah. There was a division in society then, even as there is now. We uh, hear people speak uh, or witness what they say on TV, and we see that they're diametrically opposed in many cases to the message of the Christian faith. That makes it all the more important, I believe, for us and for our family to have a church home and a church family where we come together with those that are like-minded to praise and thank God for his blessings, to call upon him in prayer, uh, to bring all of our needs and those of others to him as well. There's a Bible verse that says, uh, there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And so it is that oftentimes we may be closer to a fellow Christian than even to a relative. And as the psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. You may be seated now as we join in our sermon hymn where charity and love prevail.
our Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. And so we read in St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, his first uh, epistle, chapter 1, we give thanks to God always for you all, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And on the basis of that text, we consider the theme, Thank God for Y'all. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with earthly families, and yet we thank you for our heavenly family, to our church family, because here we gather together with those with whom we will spend eternity, and certainly we hope and pray that that's the case for our families too. We pray that uh, you would bless us as we gather here each week, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves, but rather coming together to uh, worship you and to be strengthened through your word and sacrament. We come together also to be equipped to go forth from this place to share your good news of salvation with others, that they too might join the family. By faith in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, y'all, I've been told that this expression is not in the dictionary. Well, I checked, and it is, but unfortunately the bulletin had already been printed, and so I spelled it wrong. I got the apostrophe in the wrong place. It's Y apostrophe A L L, y'all. Now, I plead that this is the first time I've ever probably printed the word in the bulletin. And uh, does that make me a southerner that I'm finally using the word y'all? I don't know. After 42 years in the South, maybe I'll start to qualify, even though I misspelled that term. According to uh, the online dictionary.com, Y'all is an Americanism dating back to the year 1855 and is most commonly spoken in the southern United States. And you know it's a slang expression for you all. Of all the dictionaries which I checked, however, it was only dictionary.com that gave this in-depth analysis of the informal pronoun, and I quote, the pronoun y'all is traditionally associated with Southern American English or African American vernacular English and is generally understood to be a plural form of you. In the South, this plural pronoun function is filled by you all, y'all, or even y'all, y-a-w-l. It's spoken in other places, too, and in every dialect where y'all is used, it serves two general functions when contrasted with you. When speakers choose y'all over you, it expresses the plural, and it conveys a friendly, informal tone. You is a choice that expresses the formality of the important occasion, while y'all in the same speech shows warmth, community, or solidarity. Well, similar expressions to y'all are you ones, you guys, yous, all y'all, all you, and I learned on my vicarage in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that a lot of Wisconsin folks say, use guys. Well, so why on earth am I starting this sermon with this uh, investigation into the word y'all? Well, the reason is pretty simple, actually. I think if the Apostle Paul had been an English speaker, he might have begun by saying to the Thessalonians, we give thanks to God always for y'all. Why? because he wanted to convey that warm, personal 
feeling that he had to his fellow Christians in the city of Thessalonica. He wanted to use a tone that showed that they were brothers and sisters in Christ, that they had an important common bond, that they were friends in Christ as well. As he continues his writing, he goes into more detail as to why he was so fond of them. He speaks in the plural, suggesting that he had spoken to other Christians. He says, we give thanks to God always for you. He's not only speaking for himself, but others that know of the Thessalonian Christians or have had contact with them. We give thanks to God always for y'all, continually remembering you in our prayers, remembering before God your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, that's our good three-point Lutheran sermon outline for today. Number one, let this be the familiar refrain in our church family. Always thank God for y'all for your work of faith. I always thank God for your work of faith. Well, our text comes from Paul's greeting at the beginning of his first letter to the Christians in Thessalonica. Paul was led by the Spirit of God from Macedonia to Philippi and from there to Thessalonica. It's estimated that at the time there were around 200,000 people living in that city. There was a large Jewish population as well as many Greeks uh, who had grown weary of the Greek paganism that promote, promoted immorality and indulgence. And so the Thessalonians were ripe for the gospel. But as in other places, Paul faced opposition too. And yet he developed a love and a devotion for the church there. I've shared this before, but when I was first assigned to be a pastor here in the Florida Georgia District back in 1981, the district president was Dr. Lloyd Bankin, and he gathered uh, at the end of the call service with the other students, uh, other pas uh, pastors-to-be who had been assigned to the Florida Georgia District. And he was talking with me about the troubled congregation in Miami that I was being sent to, how it al almost ceased to exist, and so on and so forth, and he said, Bill, just go down there and love those people and see what happens. And I did, and it worked well, and I loved this congregation too. If I didn't love y'all, I don't think I would have stayed as long as I have. And by the way, I tell people I have a very patient, long-suffering church family because some of you have been here for 32 years listening to me preach, and you're still coming. And I thank you very much for that. And so St. Paul begins by expressing his gratitude to God for the work of faith that the Thessalonian church had done. Well, what were these works? It's been suggested that Paul is uh, referring to the missionary work of the Christians there living in a very cosmopolitan city, uh, that they were willing to talk to other people uh, even though they were from pagan backgrounds and so on, that they were sharing the gospel. Uh, also, it's suggested that he's thanking God for the, the goodness of the uh, Thessalonian church in caring for others, helping others. The early Christians were well known for coming in to help when other people were going out. Uh, for example, during the days of the Black Plague, a lot of times it was the Christians who would still be there to care for the, the sick and the dying, whereas even some of their relatives would just leave them laying where they were at and they'd flee and be gone. And it's also suggested that St. Paul may have been expressing gratitude to the Christians in Thessalonica for their, for their loyalty to Christ, even in the face of persecution. And so he, in all of his writings, he makes it clear that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone, not because of our works, lest we should boast. And yet he wants to say to the Thessalonians, I thank God for you all for your work of faith. He expresses gratitude that the members of that church showed their faith 
by their works. You remember what St. James said, don't you? Faith without works is dead. He challenges his readers in his epistle, you show me your works, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, St. James too understood that we are saved not through what we do, but by what Christ did for us. And yet, faith produces fruit, the fruit of good works in the life of the believer. And Paul was grateful to God that he saw clear evidence of those works inspired by their faith. It was important for Paul to begin this way because as is the case in all of his epistles, he did have some more tough things that he needed to talk to the Christians there about. Uh, some of the people in the Thessalonian church, for example, had questioned Paul's motives in dealing with them. Uh, they, they were casting doubts upon his character and the like. So at the very outset, he dispels uh, this suspicion and confronts it head on in chapters 2 and 3. One of the other issues that he had to address was that there was uh, wrong thinking about the return of Christ. And in this case, it was that the believers took it so seriously that they were sitting around, some of them, doing nothing, just waiting for the Lord to return, thinking it would be happening any day. And they were not doing those things that they had been sent to do, remembering the Great Commission. They, they needed to be out there living the Christian life and talking to people about Jesus and sharing the gospel. You and I are also to thank God for our fellow Christians, for every faithful believer, to thank God even for that Christian brother or sister that maybe we have a personality conflict with, or maybe we just don't know all that well, or maybe we've had an issue in the past. In the love of Christ, we're able to come together, put all that behind us, and say, I love you in the Lord. Now, I think that that includes being grateful to God for Christians from other denominations, too, even though they may not agree with us in every point of doctrine. I think it's important for us to understand that every true believer in Christ, regardless of which denomination they may be in, is a brother or a sister in the Lord. And it's precisely because of our affection for other Christians that we in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod do not become involved in ecumenical endeavors. What I mean by that is this. We don't go to joint worship services that the Baptists and the Pentecostals and the Methodists are having or whoever might be hosting such a thing because we believe it's a compromise of our faith to do so. And in reality, a compromise of their faith too. If if they're getting together with us and we believe in infant baptism and they don't, they're compromising as well. And so uh, in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, we do not join in ecumenical endeavors that involve compromise of the faith that would take place in a worship service. It's both love for Christ and his word and concern for our fellow Christians that we first seek doctrinal agreement. And this is usually done on the synodical level. The Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod has people that are sent to meetings with other Christians to discuss these points of doctrine on which there are differences, to try to come to an agreement on the basis of Scripture. Uh, so there's unity in Christ. All believers in Christ are united as his family. There's also what we call concord or agreement in the teaching of Scripture. Uh, we have good reason to be especially grateful to, to God for those who agree with our Christian beliefs. This includes members of our congregation, of our First Coast Circuit, of the Florida Georgia District and its congregations, uh, and all of the congregations of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and partner churches. We have a special bond of faith in Christ expressed in doctrinal agreement and work together to accomplish God's mission. With some others, we are able to work together in other ways, despite some differences. 
We're able to work together on social ministry, feeding the hungry, uh, helping people uh, who are victims of disasters, and so on and so forth. Christopher Benfield puts it this way, There's something special about those with whom we labor. Serving the Lord together, particularly in times of adversity, creates a bond between those who work together. We ought to rejoice for those of like faith and thank God for them. It would be a lonely and a difficult task without those whom the Lord has placed alongside of us. And that includes all y'all, as well as other Christians in the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod and beyond. I thank God for y'all, for your work of faith. Secondly, St. Paul says, let this be the familiar refrain in our church family. I always thank God for you all for your labor of love. We thank God for those fellow Christians who know the love of Christ and who share it with others. We love because he first loved us. You'll remember also the words of uh, St. John in the fourth chapter of his first letter. Beloved, let us not love one another for love, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this the love of God was manifest among us that God sent his son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the one who covers our sins over by his shed blood. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And so for St. Paul, faith is a warm personal trust in the living Savior, and such faith cannot be kept from gushing forth in works of many kinds. And those works are always inspired by the love of Christ. Faith working through love is the way St. Paul says it in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. In other words, the good works that we do are not for God's benefit, or even for our own, but they're for the benefit of others. And for that reason, we can call our works, our service to the Lord, truly a labor of love for others. Again, St. James says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, And one of you says to them, go in peace and be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Living faith in Christ is willing to spend and to be spent for the sake of the gospel. Willing, uh, uh, living faith in Christ is something that uh, is directed toward others. It's been said, love in your heart isn't meant there to stay. Love isn't love till you give it away. It's been noted that the word work, as in uh, uh, work of faith, is very general. It's a word that points to the thing that is done as a matter of achievement, whereas the word labor indicates the pains spent in doing it, the exertion involved. Work may be easy and delightful. Labor is considered to be toilsome. So Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for for many. He poured himself entirely into the work of saving you and me from death by his perfect life, sinless life under the law, his substitutionary death on the cross, and of course his resurrection. And it's for that reason that we want to love others even though it may mean difficult labor or personal expense. We consider what it costs Christ to save our soul and win us back to God. Well, what is it worth to you for someone else to be saved? I think it's worth loving labor, don't you? The Greek New Testament word which Paul uses for labor 
refers to the kind of work that can produce fatigue and exhausting. It can sometimes be exhausting to love another person who has lots of problems, has a lot of needs, and yet that's one of the reasons for a Christian congregation too, isn't it? So that it doesn't all fall on one person, but rather that a group of people can come together to help to show the love of Christ. Gary Demarest, in his commentary on 1 Thessalonians, tells the story of an irate husband who came to see him and said, I'm sick and tired of giving, 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 and getting nothing in return. Good, Demarest replied. Now you've begun the labor of love. Though he often received nothing in return. God, our Heavenly Father, loves us and he went to the great trouble and sorrow of sending his son Jesus. And so uh, it's important for us to consider the work that we do for Christ a labor of love. Whenever I visit a nursing home or a hospital or talk to someone who cares for others at their home, uh, who, uh, who is helping people that have uh, need of assistance even for the basic uh, things in life, I thank them for their labor of love. People who work in care facilities or hospitals are often underpaid and do things that most of the rest of us would not want to do. Carry out a bedpan, clean up the mess when someone's been sick, help an elderly person bathe or dress. To do these things is hard work. It's often underappreciated. It's a labor of love. And so I encourage you, to also be watching and thank people when you see them really pouring themselves into a difficult task. Thank them for their labor of love. The same can be said of a waitress or a waiter in the restaurant. You know, a lot of times these days they are understaffed and maybe having to cover way more tables than usual. And rather than complain about the slow service, if that's the case, take the opportunity to thank that person for their hard work. So also, let's express our thanks to God for each other in the church who labor for the Lord because of the love he has shown to us. And don't forget to thank others uh, as you have opportunity when you see them doing difficult jobs in a loving way. And finally, let this be the familiar refrain in our church family. I always thank God for you all for your steadfast hope You'll remember that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the great love chapter, you hear those words at the very end of the chapter. Now, faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. Without love in our heart for others, we will not do those works of faith which truly help people and honor Christ. Without endurance, inspired by hope, however, will not keep at the work or the mission of Christ. Rather, we'll get tired and give up or say, let somebody else do it. And St. Paul thanks God for his fellow Christians who were keeping at it. He thanks them for that steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, he's chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in the power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. If Paul were here today, I think that he would say these things also to you. Expressing his gratitude to Christians in the world today who are finding it increasingly difficult or even dangerous to be faithful to Christ and yet our hope in him is sure. What is steadfast hope? Uh, or as some translations say, endurance inspired by hope. One author says it's not a quiet, passive resignation, but an active confidence in the face of difficulties. It's sometimes described as the spirit which can, can bear things not simply with resignation, with, but with blazing hope. This springs from hope that is more than pious optimism. It's a solid certainty. 
It's been said that uh, it's not some wishy-washy thing like, I hope to go on vacation or I hope prices go down uh, and the like, but rather hope in the Christian sense of the word is a sure and certain confidence. And uh, so it's an endurance that accepts the seemingly dreary, blind alleys of Christian experience with a spirit of persistent zeal. And this is the kind of steadfast hope that Paul saw in the city of Thessalonica. Elton Trueblood once wrote in a book called Your Other Vocation, The point is that the Christian's primary vocation is the life of Christ, while whatever we may do or make a living doing is our other vocation. Many of you are retired from daily employment, but others in our church family continue each day in the working world. We gather in this place regularly for worship and are equipped for works of service. And as True Blood says, Our primary calling is to serve the Lord. We also thank him for the daily employment which he gives that makes it possible for us to live and serve him. As we gather and when we are apart, let this be the familiar refrain for our fellow church members. I thank God for you all for that work of faith, that labor of love and that steadfast hope in Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all of our understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. We join together now in singing a song from the other songbook that gives you the opportunity to thank God for one another. It is called Thank You, number 258.
I uh, invite and encourage your prayers for my sister-in-law, Carolyn Reister. She and my brother, Dick, always join us on Sunday mornings by live stream from Savannah, Missouri. Uh, but today she is back in the hospital in St. Joe, Missouri, this time with internal bleeding. And they're having to find where the problem is and decide what they can do to fix it. We'd also pray for uh, safe travel for Linda Mattingly and her sister as they return from a wonderful trip to Europe. Pray also for safe travel for Kathy Cobb and Dorothy Head as they fly out this afternoon to, to go to Europe. And uh, we I hope you ladies will have a wonderful time. We also would uh, thank God for successful surgery for Johnny Harmon on his eye during the week. And we pray that uh, the results would be really great uh, and good news for them. Uh, we would also pray for Kyle Agney. This would be uh, Judy and Tim's grandson for him and his shipmates as their ship is in the war zone uh, in the Mediterranean. And we would pray for all of our military uh, and all of those military men and women connected to our congregation that uh, may be in harm's way. Uh, we are living in a, difficult, a dangerous and an uncertain world, as you know. And so we thank God that he is our shield and our defender. We also pray for Rachel Jackson uh, as she's having um, heart problems um, and is having a pacemaker installed. This is a friend of uh, Joe Fisher. And we would pray for Robin and Richard Paris as they're both dealing with bronchitis and are uh, recovering at home. Uh, in addition, you find the lengthy list of uh, prayers from the prayer requests from the past week in the bulletin, and we would ask the Lord to show his mercies to all of our church members, friends, relatives, and others that have special need for his help today. I believe that during the service, the sign-up sheets were going around again. Uh, the one is for this Saturday. We are having uh, on Saturday uh, between 11 and 2 our, I'm going to call it a, a fall festival, it's our Good Neighbor Day. But when we found out that the Church of God across the street is having its trunk or treat this Saturday from 11 until 2, rather than on Halloween, we decided to have our trunk or treat at the same time. So in addition to the Good Neighbor Day festivities, games, displays, uh, ice cream truck, and so on and so forth, uh, we will be having food provided to, thanks to a Thriving Action Team grant, uh, we will be uh, giving out candy. Now, we would still encourage some of you, uh, if you're able, to decorate your car. And uh, it would be parked down on this side, I believe. Uh, and we're assuming that, as in the past, people will come across uh, Dunn Avenue from the Church of God. And then the other things will be set up uh, in front of the church. Uh, so it will be a really fun, busy day. And uh, we encourage you to come and be a part of it. Uh, the sign-up sheet showed some of the things, uh, helpers that are still needed. And then the other sign-up sheet was for the All Saints Day Supper and Musical Program that we're going to be having on Wednesday, November 1st. The supper will be served between 5.30 and 6.30. The meal is free. There will be a free will offering during the service uh, for our care fund here at the church. Susan and I will be doing... Uh, this musical program twice in Iowa in the next couple of weeks and we thought it would be good to also do it here with the help of our choirs for which we are grateful so it's called singing saints uh, Christian songs through life's seasons and I really hope that you'll plan to come and join us for the meal and then for the seven o'clock service as well and then um, I would also call your attention to the radio schedule for this week uh, just an FYI, tonight at 7 o'clock, if you've not heard my interview uh, with Bill and Terry Brown, you have the opportunity to hear it in its entirety. The theme for the programming this week is the two kingdoms, the kingdom of the left, the kingdom of the right, the kingdom of this world, and the kingdom of God. And as those who have served in the Army of the United States, they're very much uh, a part of both of those kingdoms, and we thank them for their service. Join in for the interview at 7 o'clock. And I believe that the other things are uh, self-explanatory. At this time, I invite you to rise for prayer. 
you'll find the prayer printed on the middle page in the bulletin. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. For the Holy Christian Church here and scattered throughout the world and for the proclamation of the Gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. For this nation, for the military of the United States, for our leaders and all those involved in the important issues of the day, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, and for your blessing upon the harvest, let us pray to the Lord. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, for those who are underpaid or underemployed, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. For those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. For the sick and the dying, and for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. For your special blessing for Carolyn as she is hospitalized, that they might be able to uh, determine the source of the bleeding and successfully treat it. For your blessing on Johnny Harmon, that the results from his eye surgery would be excellent. For uh, uh, your blessing also for Rachel Jackson, for Robin and Richard, and for others who are uh, having health problems today, that as the great physician, you would be there to provide for their every need. Also for your blessing for Linda and her sister as they return from their travel, and for Kathy and Dorothy as they begin their trip, that all would be able to return safely and give thanks to you for the wonderful experiences that they share. And for Kyle Agney and for all those uh, from our church family that are in the military, that you would watch over them uh, in harm's way, that you would grant victory to uh, the uh, country of Israel and for all those allied nations who recognize the great evil, the inhuman um, things that have been done to Jewish people and that you would grant victory uh, in this uh, conflict to uh, the nation of Israel. Uh, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for these and all other needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, have mercy on us that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not the things eternal through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me.
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve us. Amen. Let me just add, one of the reasons I'm hoping you will sign up to come to the supper on the first is I'm doing the cooking, and I don't want to have way too much food left over. So come if you can. And now we join together in our final hymn. It is Lord Dismiss Us With Your Blessing. Turn to hymn number 924. Lord, dismiss us with your blessing. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.